I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to class this morning. Uh, for, as we get started here, a couple things I want to mention. So we are got some new equipment this week. We're uh, testing with two wireless mics and some new cords. So I've got one wireless mic going to this iPad, which is talking to that Mevu camera, which has us live right now on the internet. And then this one is talking to that camera for, uh, for a backup recording. And so we're uh, trying to still sort out some things around here. So if it looks like I'm wired for surgery, uh, it's because I am, okay? No. So you should have in front of you a set of notes for Lesson 108. Um, William the Translator, <clears throat> Tyndall, and the Biblical Narrative. So, uh, well, let's just get into this. There's a couple things in here that I've, I've I caught uh, a one mistake in the notes on page two that I'm not going to read a sentence because it's, uh, it's stated wrongly. So uh, when we get to that, I'm just going to skip it just so you're aware of it. Okay. Two weeks ago in Lesson 106, I mentioned, so if you guys that are new with us, there sh you should have notes in front of you that go along with uh, what I'm going to be presenting uh, in this hour. Two weeks ago in Lesson 106, I mentioned that I obtained Gerald Hammond's 1983 book, The Making of the English Bible. So that's this book right here. I have since found out that there was a 1982 release in Britain and then a 1983 release in the United States. A friend of mine on the internet this week posted on Facebook that he had the 1982 one and I only have the 1983 one. So of course now I'm jealous, okay? Uh, my decision to purchase this book came as I realized that Dr. David Daniel and Dr. David Norton were referencing Hammond's earlier work in their scholarly discussion of, of uh, Tyndall and his translation work. So I want to go back for a minute and uh, talk about a couple things here. In 2011, at the Great Lakes Grace Bible Conference in Wilmot, Ohio, I taught a lesson titled, The Language and Readability of the King James. So this was nine years ago. This was Memorial Day weekend almost nine years ago now, okay? That seems crazy to me. One of the points that I covered in this lesson was literary forms and features, in which I touched upon the following with respect to the King James. So in that study, I was talking about the King James Bible. I was tasked with the idea of talking about its language and readability. And so everything that I mention here, I, I talked about in that lesson with respect to the King James. Okay, so the first thing I talked about is the construction we're going to be looking at here in a little bit called the noun of noun construction, right? So let me give you an example of that. In modern English, you would say land animal. In the King James Bible, you'll read beast of the earth, right? So you'd have beast, then of, and then something. That's the noun of noun construction. So I talked about that back in 2011. I also talked in 2011 about the use of the words in the King James behold and the, and, and the word lo, where the, the text is calling your attention to something. Talked about that. I also talked about the heavy use of the conjunction and in the King James Bible, right? If you've had an English class in the last 30, 40 years, they tell you never to start a sentence with the word what? And, yet when you read the King James Bible, it's all the time saying and, and, and. We'll see that also here in a little bit. So I talked about the heavy use of the conjunction and back in 2011. And then I talked about the incorporation of Hebrew idioms or ways of speaking into the English language that come into the English language through the King James Bible. So I'm just going to read a few of these, okay? You ever heard the phrase, to lick the dust? Or the, uh, to fall flat on his face, a man after his own heart, to pour out one's heart, the land of the living. The expression, nothing new under the sun, or the phrase, under the sun, is coming from Ecclesiastes. The phrase, sour grapes, from time to time, Pride goes before a fall, the skin of my teeth, uh, to stand in awe, to put words in his mouth. So these are all idioms or English manners of speaking that are commonly used in the King James Bible. And I talked about those uh, back in 2011. And then I also talked in that lesson from 2011 about words and idioms that entered the English language through William Tyndall, which is obviously who we're talking about right now. So some of these phrases, fight the good fight, my brother's keeper, the apple of his eye, the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak, sign of the times in the cool of the day, ye of little faith, a law unto themselves, peacemaker, 
the idea of long suffering and then these singular words, okay? The word Passover did not exist in English until Tyndall worked on the 1530 Pentateuch and he literally coins the word Passover. The word Jehovah, the idea of scapegoat, that's a Tyndalian uh, word that comes into English through Tyndall. Atonement, landlady, seashore, fisherman, stumbling block, taskmaster, two-edged viper, zealous, and beautiful. These are all terms that come into the uh, English language through the translational work of William Tyndall. Okay? So if you go back to the notes, um, look at the next point. In this section, uh, this section from my 2011 lesson was heavily reliant on the following outstanding books celebrating the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible. So the King James came out in 1611, which meant 2011 was the 400th anniversary year of the King James Bible. And the specific conference that I was talking about was commemorating uh, that historical event. So I looked at, in the beginning, the story of the King James Bible and how it changed a nation, language, and culture. The Legacy of the King James Bible by Leland Rakin. Majesty, the King Behind the King James Bible by David Teen. So I used those books nine years ago to construct a lesson that covered some of the material that I just went through really fast with you here in the introduction. More recent studies have caused me to realize that many of the features noted above from the King James Bible are due in large measure to the translational decisions of William Tyndall. As a rough draft for the King James, Tyndall set the precedent for how narrative sections of the English Bible would be handled by later 16th century revisers and ultimately the King James translators. Okay, So, think about this with me for a moment. If the King James is four-fifths or 83% Tyndall, okay, then that means that a lot of the forms and manners of speaking that we went over that are exhibited in the King James Bible really had their origin with who? With William Tyndall, okay? So consequently, I like to consider the following observation, that should say observations, the following observations from Hammond's outstanding chapter titled Tyndall and the Biblical Narrative. So we're going to be looking at some stuff that uh, Hammond talks about in a chapter in his book here, The Making of the English Bible, about how Tyndall handled the biblical narrative. In Lesson 106, we observe the following statement from the preface of Tyndall's Obedience of a Christian Man. Quote, St. Jerome also translated the Bible into his mother tongue. Why may not we also? They say it cannot be translated into our tongue. It is so rude. It is not so rude as they are liars. For the Greek tongue agreeth more with the English than with the Latin. And the properties of the Hebrew tongue agreeth a thousand times more with the English than with the Latin. The manner of speaking is both one, so that in a thousand places thou needest not but translate it into English word for word. When thou must seek a, uh, seek a compass in the Latin, and yet shall have much work to translate it favorably, so that it have the same grace and sweetness, sense, and pure understanding uh, with it in the Latin as it hath in the Hebrew, a thousand parts better uh, to be it translated into English than into Latin. So we saw that statement two weeks ago. What Tyndall is saying there is that is there a higher agreement of the Hebrew tongue with the English tongue than there is with the Latin tongue and the English tongue? Yes. So you're going to have a more smooth, more flowing, more rhythmic, more dynamic translation to take it out of Hebrew and put it into English than to take it out of Latin and put it into what? English. Okay. So this is what Tyndall is saying. This is his statement at the beginning of his preface to obedience of a Christian man about the, uh, the level of convergence between Hebrew and English. Okay. Regarding this statement from the pen of William Tyndall, Gerald Hammond wrote the following in the making of the English Bible. So I'm on the top of page three. He said, quote, Tyndall's claim for the superiority of English over Latin is, in essence, a matter of comparative syntax, and broadly speaking, Tyndall is right. The major variation between Hebrew and English word order are in the Hebrew, the verb normally precedes its subject. Example, and said Moses. So we would typically say what? 
Moses said, right? In Hebrew, it, it reads, and said Moses. So it's just a syntactical order of the wording, right? That's really, one, that's really some of the only differences between English and Hebrew word order, okay? And the adjective often following the noun. In all other respects, in practical, the use and disposition of qualifying clauses, the 16th century translations follow Tyndall's lead in letting their readings be governed by the syntax of the original. So what does that mean? That means they're following the word order of what? The Hebrew text itself, right? They're not necessarily doing it or stating it the way that we might say it in English, they're following the way that it's laid out where? In Hebrew. in Hebrew. So Tyndall is the first one to do this because he's the first one to translate the Hebrew into English. We've talked about that the previous two weeks. So he is setting the tone, he's setting the precedent, he's setting the direction for these things that they're going to go in the English Bible. It's subsequently after him even. The result was the fluid and rhythmical prose which marks the narrative and poetic books of the English Bible as in these two verses from the beginning of Deuteronomy chapter 9. So this is Deuteronomy chapter 9 verses 1 and 2 in Tyndall. This is what he said. Hear Israel, thou goest over Jordan this day to go and conquer nations greater and mightier than thyself and cities great and walled up to heaven, and people great and tall, even the children of the Amalekites, which thou knowest, and of whom thou hast heard say, who is able to stand before the children of Anak? So that's Tyndall. All right. Regarding this example from Deuteronomy chapter 9, Hammond states the following quote. Here, Tyndall's only deviation from his original is, pl is the placing of this day after Jordan. The Hebrew has, you pass over this day the Jordan. So there's a difference there that he made an adjustment for English. Otherwise, his, rhythm his rhythmical assurance is virtually the Hebrews. Three times he reproduces the noun, adjective, adjective order. Nation, greater and mightier. Why is he saying that in English? He's saying that in English because that's what it says where? In Hebrew. So somebody get out, I, my, I have too much stuff out here. Somebody get out your King James Bible and open up to Deuteronomy chapter 9 and tell me if it says in verse 1, nations greater, greater and mightier in the King James. So, so if it does then that means that, that construct and that structure, they're, they're pretty much following who? All right, I kind of already know the answer, but you need to see it for yourself. Somebody find Deuteronomy chapter 9, and if you would, read out loud for me verse 1. Whoever the first one is to get it. Hear, O Israel, thou art to pass over Jordan this day, to go in to possess nations greater, greater and mightier than thyself, cities great and fenced up to heaven. Okay, so when the king, so the King James is following that order, right? It says to conquer cities greater and mightier than thyself. Same as what Tyndall says, right? So when the King James is following that order, that at that noun, adjective, adjective order there, not only are they following Tyndall, but Tyndall got that from where? He got it directly out of Hebrew. Okay, so go back to the notes there in that quote. Three times he reproduces the noun, the noun, adjective, adjective order, nation greater and mightier. Then he's got also cities great and walled up, and people great and tall. So you have the noun, adjective, adjective order there in English. The reason it's stated that way in English is because that's the way it's stated where? In Hebrew. So who bequeaths, if you will, to the English Bible that form? Tyndall does because he's following what? The Hebrew. Okay? And by trusting the syntax uh, uh, rapport between English and Hebrew, he threads his way through the multiple qualifications. First, of the journey's purpose, to go and conquer nations, cities, and people. Then, of the people who present the greatest threat, the Amalekites, um, which they know and of whom they have heard, 
uh, say who can stand before them. A comeliness here would have been more than normally damaging to the narrative because this is the, uh, a moment of high drama as Moses steals the people to challenge a formidable enemy he needs and the translation must evoke this rhythmical certainty of the prophet. So in other words, if you didn't do it that way and you did it some other way, would it have the same effect when you read it in English? No. no. The way he does it, he's creating the effect of high drama in the, in the scene of the narrative as we get to this point, as the children of Israel are going to cross over. Okay? Thus translating, before the use of verse numbers with the Geneva, Tyndall was able to think in paragraphs rather than in verses according to Hammond. Now, the first Bible to use, the first English Bible to put in verse numbers was the Geneva Bible in 1557, 1556. Tyndall's doing this work in the 1520s and the 1530s, and they weren't using verse numbers yet. So if you recall last week and the week before when I put images on the TV, none of them had verse numbers in them the way you have in your Bible now. So Hammond is suggesting that when Tyndall is not needing to worry about individual verse numbers, and he's just translating more paragraph for paragraph, he's able to create a, a flow in English. Okay, So look what he says here. By thinking in paragraphs rather than verses, Tyndall was able, when the context required it, to link together a succession of qualifying clauses to make one elaborate statement. For instance, in Numbers 14, verses 20 through 25, God explains to the children of Israel why, with the exception of Caleb, they will not be allowed to see the promised land. This is Tyndall's beautifully uh, articulated rendering of this promise. So if you want to get your King James, you can find Numbers 14, verse 20. And I'm going to read what Tyndall said out loud. If you want to follow with what the King James has in that passage. Okay? So if you're going to do that, you want to grab Numbers 14, and we'll start at verse 20. And then I'm going to read it out loud as Tyndall has it. <clears throat> All right? So verse 20. Numbers 14, verse 20. And the Lord said, I have forgiven it according to thy request. But, but as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with my glory. For all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and yet have tempted me these ten times, and have not hearkened unto my voice, there shall not one see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them be, neither shall any of them that rallied up, railed, excuse me, railed upon me see it, but my servant Caleb, because there is also, because there is another manner, spirit with him. I'm not sure that's right. There's another spirit with him, and because he hath followed unto and because he hath followed me unto the utmost, him will I bring into the land which he have walked in, which he hath walked in, and his seed shall conquer it, and also the Amalekites and the Canaanites, which dwell in the low countries, tomorrow turn you and get you into the wilderness, even to the way toward the Red Sea. Now, how much of it is the same? A lot. Almost a lot. Would you, I'd say I've, I've already done it. Right? I've already looked at it. It's at least 90% the same, yeah. right? Between the way Tyndall originally said it in 1530 and what you have in a King James Bible today, right? It is very, very similar in structure, tone, flow, wording, and all sorts of other things, okay? Then after that, Hammond says, I'm on the top of page four. You guys just came in. There is a mass of varied information given here, but the reader finds his way through it sheer-footedly, and this is because of, and not despite the fact that uh, from, for all these to the low countries, is a practice, is, uh, it is in practice one sentence. So the majority of what we read there is how many sentences in English? One, the way Tyndall originally punctuated it. Okay? 
The original punctuation was to stop after see it. That in these three and a half verses, that is three and a half verses turned into an English sentence of well over 100 words. So here's the point, okay? When Tyndall sits to translate that, is he thinking about individual verses or is he thinking about a paragraph? He's thinking about a paragraph, right? And as he sits to translate the paragraph, the contents of it that you have in your Bible and what I just read are about 90% the same, right? The major difference between the way it reads in, a, in, a, in your modern King James Bible and, and what Tyndall had is largely a matter of punctuation as you start accounting for changes in English punctuation over time. Okay? Anybody got any questions about any of that before we move on? Hope this is all making sense. So, when compared, so here's his other comment. When compared against the King James rendering for the same passage, Hammond observes the following quote. In fact, very little has changed. There are some improvements in vocabulary, notably provoked, replaced, railed upon, and fully replace, replaces unto the utmost. But the authorized, should say authorized versions, the authorized version's word order is basically Tyndall's and therefore the Hebrews too. Even so, the effect of reading the two is not the same. Tyndall's flow has been replaced by a more haltering rendering on account of what? The punctuation. Now, I'm not saying that's bad. I'm not saying it shouldn't be punctuated the way it is in the King James Bible because to accurately express the thought in our language, we need punctuation. It's the way our language works, right? I wish it wasn't, trust me, when I write stuff, but it is. We need punctuation. And you know that the punctuation changed significantly between 1530 when he's writing, the, when he's translated the Pentateuch, and 1611 when the King James translators are doing their work. There's a huge change in orthography, punctuation, all sorts of things are changing in the English language during that roughly 80 year time period. Okay? But again, the point still stands. Is your King James Bible fundamentally Tyndall in that passage? Yes. Yes. Okay. Hammond's observations regarding the similarities between the Old Testament renderings of William Tyndall and the authorized version suggests yet again that Tyndall's Old Testament work, where available, served as the rough draft for the King James in the Old Testament as well as the New. So remember last week we saw that Tyndall translates something like 36% of the Old Testament, right? Which leaves over 40% that somebody else is going to have to do because they killed him before he could finish it. Remember we went over that too, right? So in that 36% that Tyndall gave us or left us translations of the Old Testament, the King James is still largely who? Tyndall, Tyndall in those cases, okay? Now, turn with me in your Bible to Genesis 3. I want to do another experiment or comparison here. There's a long section here. It's a long section here where um, Hammond reproduces... Uh, the, the account of the fall from Genesis chapter 3. It's, uh, it's quite long, and I didn't type it all into the notes because I wanted to kind of do another exercise here, right? So I'm going to read Genesis chapter 3 from Tyndall's translation, and as I read it, I want you to follow along in your King James Bible, okay? Is everybody with me? All right, and we're going to read down through the end of verse... Um, I believe it's 19. Let me just check. Just give me one second here to check something. Sorry. Yes, to the end of verse 19. Starting with verse 1, yes. All right, verse 1. So this is Tyndall. But the serpent was subtler than all the beasts of the field which the Lord God had made and said unto the woman... Ah, sir, that, that God hath said, 
Ye shall not eat of all manner, all manner trees in the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, Of the fruit of the trees in the garden we may eat. But of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, said God, See that ye eat not, and see that ye touch it not, lest ye die. Then said the serpent unto the woman, Thus ye shall, thus ye shall not die, but God doth know that whensoever ye should eat of it, your eyes should be opened, and you, and sorry, and ye should be as God, and know both good and evil. And the woman, and the woman saw that it was a good tree to eat of, and lusty unto the eyes, and a pleasant tree for to make wise. And took of the fruit of it and ate, and gave unto her husband also with her, and he ate. And the eyes of both of them were opened, that they understood how that they were naked. Then they sewed fig leaves together and made them aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God as he walked in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam hid himself and his wife from the face of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he answered, uh, Thy voice I heard in the garden, but I was afraid because I was naked, and therefore hid myself. And he said, Who told thee thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree which I bade thee that thou shouldest not eat? And Adam answered, The woman which thou gavest, the woman that thou gavest to bear me company, she took me of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said unto the woman, Wherefore didst thou sow? And the woman answered, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done most, because, sorry, because thou hast so done, most cursed be thou of all cattle and of all beasts of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go. And the earth... Uh, shall all thy day and the earth sh see it, even I struggle at places and earth shalt thou eat all the days of thy life moreover I will put hatred between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed and thou shalt tread thee on the head and thou shalt tread it on the heel and the woman and unto the woman he said I will surely increase thy sorrow, and make thee oft with child, and with pain shalt thou be delivered. And thy lusts shall pertain unto thy husband, and he shall rule thee. And unto Adam he saith, For as much as thou hast obeyed the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat thereof, Cursed is the earth for thy sake, in sorrow shalt thou eat thereof all the days of thy life, and it shall bear thorns and thistles unto thee, and thou shalt eat the herbs of the field, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, until thou return unto the earth from whence, from under the earth whence thou wast taken, from earth thou art, and unto earth thou shalt return. Now, what do you think about the similarity? It's pretty close, right? Now, there are definitely some wording differences, but does the structure and the flow and the syntax match the rhyme and the meter of what you have in front of you? Yeah. Okay. Now, why does the King James read that way? Because that's how who, who's, who's setting it in English. That's how Tyndall's doing it. Why is he doing it that way? He's doing it that way because that's the way the Hebrew was. Reads. Okay, so let's look at the quote now from Hammond. <clears throat> After quoting Tyndall's rendition of the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden, Hammond notes the following regarding Tyndall's uh, propensity to follow the Hebrew word, or, word order gives the English rhyme and strength. He says, quote, The power of this passage lies in its uh, revelation of how disturbingly close this comedy 
How disturbingly close to comedy this archetypal comedy comes in the contrast of God's omniscience, the serpent's guile, with the human's ignorance and naivete. What gives the contrast their strength is the unsophisticated sequential narrative. Tyndall seldom ignores the Hebrew wa and, ra and rarely gives it any other form, any other form of translation than and. How many times did it say and this and this and this and this? Right? Where's that coming from? The Hebrew. It's coming from the Hebrew. Okay. And to a remarkable extent, the original's word order is followed, even to the point of reproducing most of the subject, verb, or verb qualifying clause inversions of the Hebrew. Their narrative function uh, is that they come to present the voice of God, giving his works a rhetorical emphasis which detaches it from the more common discourse of the snake and Adam and Eve. It occurs first in Eve's recollection of God's injunction, quote, of the fruit of the trees in the garden we may eat, and, quote, of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, see that ye eat it not. And the phrase I omitted here was uh, the parenthetical, God said. It recurs in Adam's frightened response, quote, Thy voice I heard in the garden, but comes to a fullness in the curses administered to the three fallen creatures. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, earth shalt thou eat, pain shall, with pain shalt thou be delivered, in sorrow shalt thou eat thereof, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, unto earth shalt thou return. You see how that, that, that structure there is the same and it's repeated over and over and over again in the way God is issuing forth the punishments as a result of what they've decided to do here. Okay? Earlier in his book, on pages 26 and 29, Hammond discusses the importance and use of the English conjunction and wa in Hebrew uh, in the King James and how the, trend, uh, and how the trend for doing so was set by William Tyndall. So, do we need to read that? I don't think we do. Do you guys get the point, right? So, when he's using, when he's using the expression wa in Hebrew... W A W, he's rendering it how? And. and. So when the King James does that, why are they doing that? Because Tyndall. Tyndall did it. Why did Tyndall do it? Because of, of the Hebrew, right? So there is one thing here as I'm re remembering what's here that I want to make sure that we mention. Okay? Go with me in your Bible. Go to Genesis 33. Go to Genesis chapter 33. Genesis chapter 33, so he says here uh, in his books, so I'm reading now from page 27 of um, the making of the English Bible. I'm reading from page 27. He's talking about this, this use of, the, of and and how this is done by Tyndall and later by the King James. And he says, us, he says that, um, talking about and, reserved for special uh, emphasis their frequent use was felt in, uh, intrinsically and, and uh, to be inconsistent with the lightness and grace of the movement. Well, that doesn't matter, okay? So, words like, some words that could be used, or, then, but, notwithstanding, how be it, so, thus, therefore, that, constantly appear in modern versions where the King James is just going to say what? And. and. Okay? This is true and valuable distinction between Hebrew and English styles, and note the entire truth, and not, but not the entire truth, because it needs to be said that the authorized version employs the simplest English conjunction more often than it ever needs to. For all of its notwithstandings and how be its, its principal narrative syntactical vehicle is and. Okay? So the King James, sometimes it'll say how be it or wherefore, or it'll say something like that, right? And everyone's like, oh man, that's so old fashioned. I can't understand that, right? That's what they complain about. But the King James is going to use and more than any other conjunction. 
All right, so let's look at it in, note it as we read Genesis 33, verses 1 through 8. Okay? What's the first word of verse 1? And. And. And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau came, and with him four hundred men, and he divided the children unto Leah and unto Rachel and unto the two handmaidens. And, beginning of verse 2, he put the handmaidens and their children foremost, and Leah and her children after, and Rachel and Joseph hindermost. And he passed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother and Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. A lot of ants, right? And he lifted up his eyes and saw the women, the woman, sorry, the women and the children and said, uh, who are those with thee? And he said, The children which God hath graciously given thy servant. Then the handmaidens came near, they and their children, and they bowed themselves. And Leah also with her children came near and bowed herself. And Esther Joseph came near and Rachel and bowed themselves. And he said, I think you get the point, right? How many times are you? How many times is the King James saying and in that passage? A bunch. I didn't even count them all. A bunch. The point which uh, my reader will have anticipated here is that every and in the authorized version's rendering, and he's going to give us the number here, and there are 33 of them in eight verses, all right, is a faithful reproduction of the Hebrew wa that I wrote over there on the board. More than this, only once is the wa given a variant translation and that is by the word then at the beginning of verse 6. What do you have at the beginning of verse 6? Then. then. That's the only time the Hebrew word wa occurs in those eight verses that they said anything other than what? Then. And. Okay? Um, so with this one exception, reading the authorized version is syntaxically and that means, so far as style is concerned, essentially the same as reading the Hebrew. Okay? Now again, where did that form come from? Who's the first one to do it? Tyndall. Tyndall. You guys following this? Okay. Tyndall, and I want to scroll this down here, because I want to make reference to this. Okay. Tyndall's trust in the original's word order is at least partly responsible for one other rhythmic effect in the English Bible, according to Hammond. Quote, This is the noun of noun constitution, which is commonly used to translate the Hebrew construct form. This form most often expresses a gentival? Genital. What? I don't even know what that means. Genitive relationship between the two nouns and is by far the commonest way for biblical Hebrew to express such a relationship. So instead of forms like Moses book, Hebrew puts the Hebrew puts first the object of possession and then the possessor, i.e. the book of who? Moses. Moses. I should add that the construct form is not limited to genitival relationships. Its other uses cover many of the areas where an English reader would normally expect an adjective so that instead of saying, for instance, a strong man, Hebrew is more likely to say men of strength. The construct is almost invariably used to express a superlative. Instead of the best song or the holiest place, Hebrew has the song of songs and the holy of what? Holies. Holies. Now, isn't that a better, doesn't that just sound better? Doesn't it sound better to say song of songs than to say the best song? Yeah. Okay, so it's a, when you see that stuff in your English Bible, you're, it's coming into English through Hebrew, okay? Tyndall's allegiance to the Hebrew word order accordingly encourages him to use the noun of noun construct and the appropriate English equivalent. 
Any other would mean either a paraphrase or a reversal of the Hebrew word order. His constant use of the one form robs his translation of the kind of variety which English is capable of. What he gains, however, is a rhythmic repetitiveness, a pattern of description which extends throughout the narrative. Now, let me be clear. Is English more flexible than Tyndall's using it? It is. But he's in his use of English, he's not trying to be flexible. He's trying to state in English as accurately as he can what it says where? In the Hebrew. In the Hebrew okay. So let's look at the, some of the phrases from the narrative we just read in Genesis 3. Think about the statements. The beasts of the field. The fruit of the trees. The midst of the garden. The voice of the Lord God. The cool of the day, the face of the Lord God, the trees of the garden, the beasts of the field, all the days of thy life, the voice of thy wife, all the days of thy life, the herbs of the field, the sweat of thy face. That's all woven through that whole narrative in English because as he takes it out of English, and, or sorry, as he takes it out of Hebrew and puts it into English, is he following the word order? So it creates a poetic rhythmic flow as you read it then in English. Okay? And it does not end here. In the next three verses, there are five more noun of noun constructions. So let's read it. And Adam called his wife Eve, because she was the mother of all that liveth. And the Lord God made Adam and his wife garments of skins, and put them on them. And the Lord God said, Lo, Adam is be lo, Adam is because as it were one of us in knowledge of good and evil, but now lest he stretch forth his hands and take also of the tree of life and eat and live how long? Forever. Forever. The consequences of Bible English of Tyndall's literal literal rendering of the construct are enormous. He set the pattern for succeeding translations with the result of many of the more distinctive biblical phrases have this form. And this is by no means comprehensive list from Psalms alone. So I'm going to put this up here. So I want to go through this. We're looking at, this is just from the book of Psalms. Psalms 1.1, the seat of the scornful. Psalms 2.9, rod of iron. Psalms 8.2, the mouth of babes and sucklings. The fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, the paths of the sea. Psalm 8.8, 8. the shadow of thy wings. 17.8, the wings of the wind. 18.100, ah, we're going to check that. I'm not sure that's right. I think that should say 18.10 parenthesis. Because if you hit control zero, you'll get the print, I think, but whatever. Okay, The words of my mouth and meditation of my heart, Psalm 19, 14. A reproach of men and despise of the people, the valley of the shadow of death, the sins of thy youth, the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, the beauty of holiness, the strife of tongues in time of trouble, the end of the earth, the voice of chambers, the help of man, a father of the fatherless and a judge of widows, the wings of a dove, the bread of tears, the house of God, the tents of wickedness, the snare of, it should say snare of the fowler, uh, a pelican, is that right? A pelican of the wilderness and an owl of the desert, a flower of the field, the fear of the Lord, the beginning of wisdom, the sight of the Lord, the death of the saints, the tents of Kedar, the bread of sorrows, the rivers of Babylon, the songs of Zion, the wings of the morning, the uttermost parts of the sea, the son of man, so we're down here, the son of man, and the strength of thy house, the legs of a man, and fetters of iron. All of those, now, Tyndall didn't translate... Psalms, right? But the, the guys who did, are they following the noun of noun structure and pattern and precedent that was set by who? Tyndall. Okay? So let me get the... 
In addition to noting Tyndall's utilization of the noun of noun structure of the Hebrew text, Hammond notes how Tyndall's mastery of prose rhythm brought interest and life to otherwise difficult passages. In Deuteronomy, for instance, he threads his way through the complexities of the Hebraic law with the same rhythmic clarity which he has brought to the opening chapters of Genesis. <clears throat> and there the clue lies in his willingness to allow the Hebrew word order to govern the English. Tyndall, incidentally, did not consider Deuteronomy a barren book. Much the opposite, he described it as, quote, a book worthy to be read day and night and never to be out of hands, the most excellent of all the books of Moses. I don't know if I agree, but that's what he said. I read Deuteronomy and it's not all that exciting to me. Okay, But in the hands of a modern translator, large parts of it read like the relics of an inhumane past for instance, the New English Bible's translation of 21, so this would be of Deuteronomy, chapter 21, verses 10 through 14, a passage describing the fate of a woman taken captive in war. Okay? So this is what the New English Bible from 1970 had. This is the way it reads. When you wage war against your enemy, and the Lord your God delivers them into your hands, and you take some of them captive... Then if you see a comely woman among the captives and take a liking to her, you may marry her. You shall bring her into your house where she shall shave her head, pare her nails, and discard the clothes which she had when captured. Then she shall stay in your house and mourn for her father and her mother for a full month. After that, you may have intercourse with her, you shall, be, uh, you shall be her husband and she your wife, but if you no longer find her pleasing, let, uh, let her go free. You must not sell her nor treat her harshly since you had your way with her. So it's, that's the way it reads in um, the New English Bible. For the modern translator, the feeling has gone out of the passage. Understandably, perhaps, given the remoteness of the situation, the words I have italicized are a combination of the uh, euphemistic and technical, and because of them, the situation becomes increasingly remote to the reader. Now look at the same passage in Tyndall's version. So we're going to read the same passage in Tyndall. <clears throat> he says, or said, when thou goest to war against thine enemies, and the Lord thy God hath delivered them into thine hands, and thou hast taken them captive, and seest among them, among the captives, a beautiful woman, and hast a fantasy unto her that thou wouldest have her to thy wife, then bring her home to thine house, and let her shave her head, and pare her nails, and put her raiment that she was taken in from her, and let her remain in thine house, and beweep her father and her mother a month long, and after that go in unto her, and marry her, and let her be thy wife. And if thou have, and, and, and if thou have no favor unto her, then let her go whither she lusteth. For thou mayest not sell her for money, nor make um, shevisance of her, because thou hast humbled her. Okay? Now, do you think that they were using the word intercourse back in ancient Hebrew? No. no. Tyndall avoids technicality and euphemism. The directness, even forcefulness of the words he uses help to make so alien a code of behavior something which we can understand and feel human contact with. In effect, a small tragedy is played out. The man has a fantasy towards a beautiful woman captive as opposed to taking a liking towards, towards a comely one. He has her to his wife, and he puts from her the remnants of her previous life. The New, the new English had, mar had marries and discards. She beweeps her dead parents instead of mourn. And then the man goes in unto her instead of has intercourse. Inevitably, the infatuation pales. He has no favor unto her, and he lets her go whither she lusteth. New, the other one had let her go free. 
But the legal proviso remains that he must not exploit her because he has already humbled her instead of had his way with her. In each case, Tyndall's renderings are closer than the New English Bibles, so the simple root meanings of the Hebrew words and phrases. Equally important, though, is the syntaxical contrast between the two versions. The modern translators do their best to keep each item in sequence of events distinct and detached, while Tyndall's version is to all uh, intents and purposes one extended sentence. I labor the analysis a little. In reality, I am only explaining what every reader instinctually feels. The Tyndall moves continually towards the liveliness of narrative, where modern translations tr uh, retreat to the lifelessness of a scholarly document. Does everybody understand what he's saying here? Okay, I know this is all technical and you're all just so excited right now, I know. Okay. So we can go on with this, right? You've got the same form, uh, more textual examples from law-giving passages, like the one cited by Hammond in his, are, are found in his book. Hammond concludes his chapter on Tyndall and the biblical narrative by framing a discussion of Tyndall's narrative style in the historical books of Joshua to 2 Kings with a lengthy discussion of Judges chapter 19 as a case study. Now, do we want to read this or not? I will leave it to your... I could commend this to you to read on your own time, or we can go through it. I don't care one way or the other, but it's more detail about how Tyndall is handling these passages um, when he sets out to translate them into English. And um, it, 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 I find it interesting, but we don't have to go through all of it if, if you guys don't want to. So you tell me what you want to do. I'm also trying to be mindful of the clock here. It's kind of more of the same type of analysis. Let's just go to the end of, let's just go to page nine. Now, I do think that you should read all, you should read the bottom of page 7 and all of page 8 when you have time to read those notes because it is interesting to understand what he says. So I want page 9, the first dark bullet. Hammond concludes his chapter on Tyndall and, the, uh, Tyndall and biblical narrative with the following statement of Tyndall's enduring impact. He says, quote, Tyndall's translation of this narrative, he's referring to Judges 19, was written at a time when English prose was often an unwieldy, virtually stylus, styless thing, and yet it has scarcely a word which a modern reader might find obscure or ill-placed, or a sentence which reads uncouthly. And its grip, and its grip upon the reader is immediate and never lessens. This capacity to recreate biblical narratives so powerfully was Tyndall's greatest contribution, that's to say contribution, to the authorized version. And through that, to Bunyan and Defoe, the early Puritan pioneers, and the greatest of all forms, the novel. So, what, what's he saying there? He's saying that some of the greatest writers in English... Defoe and Bunyan, they are following form and structure that was first set out by who? Tyndall. Tyndall. Okay? So conclusion. In summation, I would like to leave you with the following citation from the pen of Gerald Hammond regarding William the Translator. Quote, What it adds up to then is that Tyndall was a translator whose judgment was usually good. Working in extraordinarily adverse conditions, at his day, frontiers of knowledge of biblical languages. So in other words, we don't know, he did not have available to him all the knowledge that people have today. Okay, He produced translations which set the pattern for all English translators who followed. Simple, flexible, but often surprisingly literal and with a fine capacity to tap the emotional resources of his original, these are his chief qualities. It is astounding to think that the first guy who put 
the English Bible into print. And when I say print, I mean print, not manuscript, right? We're not talking handwritten copies. We're talking printed text on a printing press. Did such an outstanding job that it is the King James Bible that the British Empire took around the world and taught people, literally taught people English with, was still fundamentally a Tyndalean document. Okay? So does anybody have any questions or comments about all of this, or any of this, uh, before we close off and look at moving on next Sunday? I know you're all excited, right? I can just see it. This is just a riveting lesson, and you're all just jumping out of your seat, and this was the best hour you've ever spent of your whole life, right, Mike? Right. All right. <laughs> okay. So, what are we going to do next week? Next week, I want to look at Tyndall again and how he handled some disputed words and phrases that people often argue about in the King James Bible. I want to look at how he handled them and then what can we learn about how he handled them and how it should cause us to think or, or, or inform our thinking about some of these modern discussions. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So we're going to do that next time, and that might take two times. I keep kicking the can on Tyndall. I'm having a good time studying Tyndall, I have to say. Okay, I've been doing it now for about four or five months, and it's just proven to be absolutely fascinating study to think about all these things. But what I'm after here, guys, I'm not after here to be, quote, unquote, scholarly for the purpose of being scholarly. What I'm after here is us really getting a handle on where our Bible came from, how it came to exist, and why and how you can respect and appreciate it for what it is. Not just as God's Word, which is the ultimate reason we appreciate it, but what it is as a document and literally your King James Bible, the pinnacle of, of the English language, in my opinion. Okay, A lot of it is, is coming to us down through Tyndall, this very influential and pivotal figure who uh, we just need to make sure we understand. Anyway, I'm done. If there are no questions or comments, I'm going to stop the equipment here. If anybody has anything they want to bring up off camera, feel free to do so. Thanks for your attention.